Thank you again, everybody, for joining me on this special Middle East update on the viruses changing of the Middle East. Unbelievable things are going on right now. And uh, we will start with the following thing. After more than a year of a law, it seems like a long election campaign, after three rounds of elections, Israel is finally uh, going to have a government within a day or two. And guess what? Headed by Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, let me make it very clear. This is nothing short of a miracle. Uh, just about a week ago, the Israeli Supreme Court, um, which, by the way, we have a problem with because the, the Supreme Court in Israel is too active and is actually overriding the uh, legislative um, um, authority, the parliament. And uh, what happened is that the Supreme Court gave the Israeli Knesset speaker, the speaker of the parliament, literally 48 hours to convene the parliament so they can vote to change him. Uh, the speaker of the parliament, Yuli Edelstein, who used to, uh, he, who grew up in the former Soviet Union and was locked up in a, uh, a, a uh, labor uh, camp uh, because he's a Zionist and he, he wants to move to Israel. Listen, this hero said to the Supreme Court in Israel, what you do is not constitutional. Our parliament bylaws say that the new speaker will be um, changed when a new government is going to be uh, placed. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the big blockade of 62 members of parliament opposing Netanyahu, including the 15 anti-Zionist pro-terrorist Arabs and some of the most lunatic, progressive, left-wing people, and a Victor Lieberman, the one who hates Benjamin Netanyahu more than anything else. And he is the reason for all the, the three uh, election uh, rounds that we went through. All of them were sure that once they place one of their own people as the speaker, then they can already start legislating laws that will prevent Netanyahu from running and being elected as prime minister because of the um, uh, because of the um, things that are standing in court against him. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing short than a miracle happened. Netanyahu told the Gantz and his party, if you ever want to be prime minister, I'm your only lifeline. Let's form in these critical days of coronavirus epidemic all around the world and in Israel, let's form a, a, a government that will be emergency government. I'm going to serve only a year and a half. You will serve a year and a half. We'll change uh, the seat to the prime minister. And, um, and that's it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, when the left and the Arabs started already sewing and, and preparing their suits to replace Netanyahu and become the owners and the leaders and the rulers and the lords of the country, um, Benny Gantz was convinced that he's only a prop by the left to get Netanyahu out and actually they don't even want him at all. And he decided to take a deep breath and to be brave enough and to join Netanyahu and take all of his 16, 17 members. And finally Netanyahu has now almost a majority of 80 seats to form a, an interesting government. Let, let, let's put it this way. It's not a government I prayed for, but it's the prime minister I prayed for. And so I'm willing to take this one over the options that we had earlier. And ladies and gentlemen, ever since the Arabs are now defeated, that the left is cannot take it. They don't even know where it came from. Lieberman is dis, has disappeared, and Israel was saved from a shameful thing. And now all that Netanyahu is doing, besides running the country and doing a pretty good job in in keeping. Um, us uh, behaving well during the coronavirus thing. 
um, Netanyahu is now sitting with ben with Benny Gantz, and they're forming together the government that most likely will be sworn in in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. And let me make it very clear: the Corona virus was the catalyst for this whole thing, because the need for a national emergency government only came from that particular thing. There was no other basis for Benny Gantz to join Netanyahu. So this la little tiny microscopic virus started affecting the Middle East in ways we couldn't even imagine. And be before I even go to talk about all the other things, I'm already talking about Israel itself and the end of those shenanigans of the left wing and the Arab members who already were sure Netanyahu will be pulled out of the prime minister's residence and office for good. Ladies and gentlemen, it's nothing nothing short than America. Look, for, for, the, for the last few days, I'm like, I wake up with such a, the heaviness is, has been lifted from my chest, literally. I mean, I couldn't believe that this country that is so successful and vibrant, uh, uh, the homeland of the Jewish people is about to let anti-Zionist terror sympathizers run the show here. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that the, we went that far. Now, of course, I see the liberals all around the world doing that. But Israel, I always thought, you know, we, we know better. And this is the Middle East. We, 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 we understand who is uh, uh, surrounding us and what we are against. Uh, and um, ladies and gentlemen, a miracle. The Supreme Court thought that they will ex expedite the, 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 the process of changing Netanyahu. And little did they know that what they did, they caused this, you know, balloon, hot air balloon of, of blue and white party to just shatter to pieces. And Benny Gantz took his people and uh, now um, it's amazing. Look, we're going to have a government and we can move forward also with annexing the Judea and Samaria and Jordan Valley and all of that which is what we really wanted. Um, nowhere in the history of the last 72 years, Israel had a chance to annex those things. This is part of the deal of the century that we like. We don't like the rest of it, but the rest of it will never be implemented anyway, because the Palestinians will never make it happen. But at least let us take what we can while we can. And so we needed a government for that. We needed to vote for that. We needed a parliament for that. And now not only do we have a parliament, but we have the majority that we need to pass all of those things. It is amazing. Folks looked almost lost. It looked almost like this is it. We've come. To, and I'll listen, convince myself. You know, if God is allowing that to happen, this is the will of God. I'm not going to, uh, you know, argue with him. But in my heart, I didn't have that peace. And, and I didn't, I'm telling you, it was like a heavy weight on my chest for the longest time. And uh, wow, I am so blessed to know that there is something positive about the coronavirus, at least when it comes to the Israeli political deadlock that is no longer there. And a government is being formed as we speak. And within 24, 48 hours, we will present the government and we will take over all the parliament committees and start running the country and moving forward. This is super important. Thank you for your prayers. It is amazing. Uh, while we, we are having that victory, the Palestinians are so angry that Netanyahu is remaining in office that they decided, oh, you know, there is coronavirus crisis also in the Palestinian Authority, but who cares? Let's shoot some rockets and let's, shoot, uh, you know, send some balloons attached to some explosives. They started all over again. And of course, uh, we show them the way out. But my point is, is that <laughs> that's all they know. You know, it reminds me of how Satan is described as the one who deceives the nations. Satan is a liar, is a deceiver. He knows nothing about the truth. He knows he doesn't even know how to tell the truth. And it seems like um, we are dealing with people, as Psalm, you know, 120 says, "When I am for peace, 
they are for war. It's unbelievable. And now with all the coronavirus thing, they start spreading lies and rumors and, and that Israel is um, spreading the coronavirus in the Palestinians. Look, not only that we, we will never do that because any epidemic in their area will immediately reflect on us because, you know, there's not really a border there. But Israel sent to the Palestinians masks and and uh, uh, some um, breathing machines and also testing kits for, for the COVID-19. So if anything, we're sending them stuff and they know that, but they always choose to say the lie to the people. And it's unbelievable. <laughs> Let me tell you how in Gaza they got the coronavirus. Two Palestinian sheiks, uh, Muslim clerics, came back from Pakistan after they were received as heroes from Palestine over there. And they entered the, from Egypt all the way into Gaza and they brought the coronavirus. The uh, radical Muslim clerics, Palestinians, brought it from Pakistan via Egypt into Gaza. And now they start infecting many people around there. So look who brought it, look how they brought it, and look who they blame for all of these things. It's unbelievable. We try to help them, and they continue to spread all those lies. It's amazing because um, the coronavirus is also making unbelievable changes in the rest of the Middle East. And allow me to tell you that America decided to evacuate five out of its eight bases in Iraq. Let me explain. They say that it's because there's no more need, ISIS is defeated. Well, that's not the reason. The reason is there is a great danger of the coronavirus spreading amongst the American soldiers in Iraq right now. These are very, very crowded, small military bases. All it takes is one Iraqi with it to infect everyone inside. America decided out of the five that they decided to evacuate, three were cleared already. And uh, about a, an equipment worth of about a million dollars was left there. And over the last few hours, we watch American convoys crossing the border from Iraq into Syria to be in the region of Deir Azur, right by the Euphrates. And the, the Americans are actually, uh, they took over uh, one of the military bases there, old Syrian air base. Now they are making the runway longer, allowing B-52s and other heavy bombers to be able to land there. And America is building up right now as we speak a major, major power that is by all means is aimed to strike in the next few i don't know hours or days not it's not a coincidence that a couple uh, I, I think it was 48 hours ago in america um the um pentagon said that we are detecting movements in iraq of iranian elements that are planning a major strike on american soldiers in iraq so America is either planning a major strike on Iran or a major strike on Iranian interests and Iranian militias in Iraq. But one thing is for sure, America's soft belly is its embassy in Baghdad. And it's clear that if America is going to strike either Iran or Iran's interest in Iraq, there's a good chance America will have its Baghdad embassy fallen. And that is what everybody is now concerned about. And uh, we, we are watching some unbelievable movements, uh, a lot of air traffic in the Persian Gulf right now of, uh, of uh, reconnaissance airplanes and, and other elements, which I'm not at liberty to, to expose here. But one thing is for sure, there is a major, major power build up right now in, uh, in the Middle East for some sort of a preemptive strike that might come from 
the side of America, and uh, I, I totally get it. I totally understand why. Now let's let's move to Iran, just so you understand. In Iran, look, they say they say that. Um, um, let me check what they say about their death toll. They they reported thirty eight thousand cases of COVID nineteen and twenty six hundred twenty six hundred and forty deaths. But from what we know from the um, Iranian opposition center that is based in Paris, and that is well connected all across Iran. Everybody is collaborating with them. It, they're called Mujahideen al-Halik. And they, they uh, gathered all the information from 204 Iranian cities. And they came up with a staggering number of almost 12,000 deaths in Iran, which means Iran is by far the the highest number, um, even more than America. Right now, uh, uh, even, excuse me, more than Italy. Italy right now has the highest number of deaths with over 10,000 people. And uh, another thing that I want you to know that there is no one system and one way to determine who died from corona. Every country has its own ways. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Um, some countries uh, will obviously determine um, death from coronavirus only when you come to the hospital. And if you died while having the coronavirus, then they say you are a coronavirus uh, uh, a victim. The problem with Italy is that um, they only check people who come to the hospital. In other words, all the people that die at home, and most of them die at home, they could die from a heart attack, they could die from a, uh, from a stroke, they could die from cancer. If from some reason they found COVID-19 or some the virus in them, they will be counted as victims of COVID-19. You understand? Even though the guy died from cancer or died from a, as long as he had in his blood when they tested it after he died, he's a, a you know, so my point is, you know, even in Israel, we, added, we have 15 uh, victims so far, of which, by the way, I think 80% of them are above 90 years old with previous rich medical um, um, record and um, at least half of them would have died a few months from now from from the other diseases that they they had suffered from so again uh, the number of deaths um you know you can take it uh, uh you know the way you want but one thing is for sure the iranians we know how many people die because of the families of the victims report and we, we see satellite images of mass graves. Um, right now, by the way, I just received a report from Syria that the Iranian militias in Syria are executing any soldier suspected having COVID-19. And which we tell you, by the way, that um, they already brought the virus from Iran into Syria's battlefield, as I reported earlier. But now they, they don't want to take any risk. They execute them. They shoot them right there. They don't even wait for them to die from the coronavirus. They shoot them and they kill them and they bury them and they move on. It's unbelievable. Syria, the funny thing, Syria reports of only nine cases. Are you kidding me? Nine cases? Syria must have had so far hundreds of cases of death from coronavirus but they, they 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 don't even know how to report they don't even know how to check there is no one doing those things in syria therefore syria can say whatever syria wants and uh, you know that's what the records of the world health organization are going to show which by the way let me tell you something about the world health organization i can tell you one thing china controls that uh, body and for the longest time china withheld that body from announcing COVID-19 as a pandemic. Um, Taiwan more than once asked to be present in some 
um, conferences of uh, World Health Organizations, and they were denied access because of China. The Taiwanese warned of this pandemic. The Chinese did not allow the World Health Organization to move forward with those uh, uh, predictions. And uh, not only did the Chinese cover up for at least two, three weeks, where things could have been way better today, but the World Health Organization covered up for the Chinese for at least two, three more weeks added to that one. And so more than a month into this pandemic, the world woke up to it. And as you can see right now, China is doing better while everybody else are now suffering. In fact, I just received some messages from China. I saw pictures and videos of places across China where they are celebrating the fact that America has passed the 100,000 cases. And they say uh, it's a victory for China in its war against America, which brings you back to why this whole thing must have started, um, probably because of that trade war that uh, the Chinese didn't like uh, seeing Trump uh, win over and over again and again. Folks, it's heartbreaking to see that uh, uh, Europe is not helping you European countries. <laughs> the EU is worthless. NATO couldn't help any of its members. Uh, uh, people realize that all of those alliances, when they put their their health in somebody else's hands, when they put their security in somebody else's hands, they realize nobody will come to help them. And what I'm watching right now is almost the collapse of the EU because all the Schengen agreement from 1995 of no need for passport control, Europe. Let me show you what the Schengen uh, 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 look like. I'm, 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 I'm basically showing you, um, yes, this is, uh, okay, so take a look. This is Europe, as you can see on the right. And all the blue that you see is the Schengen area where you have no need for a passport when you cross from one country to another. All of them met in 1995. Now, not all of them are members of the EU, such as Switzerland, which is not an EU member, but is part of the Schengen Agreement. And you just, there is no borders anymore. No border. Europe is one country for the sake of, of, of uh, passport control and all of that. And this is exactly why Italy couldn't shut down its borders. Now, way into that, Europe realized, the EU realized they must allow countries to shut down its, their borders. And by doing so, Schengen Agreement went down the drains. That's it. Now, Germany understands we must, we must close our borders. Belgium understands this. Spain understands. Uh, uh, the Netherlands understand, all of them understand that we cannot allow the borders to be open. And you're watching right now how the world that used to dance to the music of globalism, used to dance to the music of no need for borders, is now imposing back the borders that the globalists tried to get rid of. And we're watching some unbelievable things happening in Europe as we speak right now. And China, in order to polish its conscience for what it did, China is now sending equipment and medications to Spain and Italy. But what they don't tell you is that the Spanish government just returned half of what the Chinese sent because it was all useless and worthless. So the Chinese are selling stuff now. The Chinese are sending stuff right now. They're trying to be the good guys in the story. But I'm telling you, the world is furious with China right now. And I, I suspect that uh, the aftermath of the coronavirus crisis will be a very, very tough time for China to get back to uh, business as usual. Um, so we talked about Iran. And uh, I mentioned to you folks that um, the death toll there across the 11,000, close to 12,000 people. Among them, there are Ayatollahs. 
ayatollahs, closest members to Khamenei and to Rouhani, some people from Khamenei's office. Khamenei's son lost his mother-in-law to the coronavirus. Um, I, I mean, clerics and generals and people who did evil things to their own people and to others. They're one after the other dying like flies. And it's interesting because the, the, the Iranians come up with some weird uh, theories that they, A, they say these are demons, B, they say that America and Israel are behind it. And uh, it's, un, it's just unbelievable to see all the things that come across their mind. Of course they know it's not true, but they won't continue to lie to their people. But unfortunately, it cannot really happen for too long. So out of the 204 cities in Iran, more than 11,000 people dead. I don't even want to think about how many people uh, contracted the virus over there. Unbelievable. In fact, the virus is hitting almost every Arab major country right now, and it is changing a lot of what is going on. Mecca is completely empty from um, worshippers. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, the Houthis in, in, in Yemen yesterday were trying to hit some strategic targets in Riyadh, uh, capital of Saudi Arabia. And um, several of those ballistic missiles that were fired from Yemen's territory into Saudi Arabia were intercepted by the Saudis. And uh, this is the war that the world will not tell you about, but it's an ongoing war between the Yemen Houthis and the Saudi, and they are funded by the Iranians. But let me make it clear. The Iranians can sacrifice 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, and they will not for a minute let go of their plan to take over the Middle East. And first and foremost, to take over Saudi Arabia and declare themselves as the leaders of the Muslim world. And let me make it very clear also that we believe that uh, the biggest uh, uh, effort that Iran is gonna make right now uh, is once the Americans are leaving Iraq to immediately go in and take over all that America has left behind and uh, immediately gain back the full control of Iraq and, and, and by doing so securing back their um, bridge that they want to build all the way from Tehran to Beirut and to Okay, I think I'm back on camera. So, so this is it basically. We are definitely watching some unbelievable things going on. Um, and uh, regarding America, a lot of people are asking me, so uh, let us uh, know, what do you think? Uh, how are those things that are happening right now in America are uh, playing into the globalists and to the um, new world order or to the one world government agenda. And I, I quoted today, um, I quoted today um, this and I said, people ask me about that. And isn't it interesting that the coronavirus is currently stripping Americans of their freedom to assemble, freedoms to worship, uh, in churches, freedoms to buy and sell, freedoms to exercise their Second Amendment rights as uh, weapon shops are being closed, and of course, freedoms to live a life unfettered by a growing, burdensome government. I believe that what is happening right now is just temporary. I believe that as long as Trump is in office, it's almost definitely a temporary situation. But bear in mind, folks, one day, and I can tell you that I bet the farm on that one. It won't be temporary. 
And that right there is the real takeaway lesson for the coronavirus age. I, I believe that what we see now is like dry run, dry test for, for the day that uh, the, the world will unite together. Gordon uh, Brown, the ex-prime minister of Britain, just called for a one world government to tackle the coronavirus issue. Uh, we're watching uh, digital currencies that are now being offered as global currencies. We're watching how um, people are being um, uh, trained to uh, give up their freedoms uh, for the sake of fighting an invisible, an invisible, uh, um, of course, um, enemy, a joint enemy. You know. This is like the a ripe fruit that fell in the hands of the globalists because so far w global warming didn't help them. So far wars didn't help them. So far uh, capitalism versus communism, all of these things didn't really help them. And now such a virus that is affecting 199 countries simultaneously now this is like the best thing that happened. Now all the left-wing liberal media outlets will tell you how horrific it is and how terrible it is and how there's nothing we can do and how the system is falling apart and how it's important to join hands and remove borders and act as one government all around the world to tackle this issue. And you are going to see that happening more and more and more and more. And I'm not even mentioning what is planned when it comes to vaccination and when it comes to what is going to be added to it. Uh, two days from now, I'm going to hold a special update on how close are we to the mark of the beast. Now, I'm not going to tell you what we're going to talk about right now, but all of us together are going to dive into the book of Revelation. We're going to try and understand what is the mark of the beast all about, and we're going to try and understand where are we now, today, on the, uh, on the road to the mark of the beast. And you'll be surprised. You'll be amazed. I'm sure it's going to be great. It's going to be a discussion. I will have a couple more gentlemen with me to speak about this, uh, we will analyze it scripturally. And but we will we will see so many things happening. Um, next week, I'm going to release um, the special teaching video that I made on Armageddon. So many people look at what's going on right now, and they think, is that Armageddon? Is that the end of humanity? What is Armageddon? Who is it for? What is it all about? I uh, recorded a wonderful uh, time with uh, me and my son, Ariel, and, and I will release it next week, and you'll be greatly blessed, I am more than sure. And I would like to conclude with two verses from the scriptures, uh, two verses that um, I, I get a lot, I get thousands of messages from people, and the two verses are are standing out by most of them who who received them from the Lord in the last 48 hours. Uh, the first one I would like to uh, show you is um, the verse from uh, Revelation 3:20. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that you see the verse itself. Um, yes, um, and the verse is, "Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if." anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. There is some, I mean, I'm talking about thousands of people around the world that are receiving this verse as we speak on this soon return of Christ. And, and, and all of this particular crisis is we have national and we have community and we have personal visits of Christ to, to uh, you know, to uh, ask people. So, is this virus enough for you to change your life? To change your, uh, uh, your, uh, I guess, uh, priorities, folks. I'm watching unbelievable. I, I 
a friend of mine in Brazil sent me a video of one of the favelas. Favelas are the poor slums of Rio de Janeiro. And in the favela, everybody's standing outside of their little huts and they're all singing worship songs in Portuguese. I saw places in India, in the suburbs of Mumbai, where people all are singing worship songs. I see people standing outside of hospital. I see doctors standing on hospital rooftops. I see nurses. I see, I see huge wave of people that are moved by what is happening right now um, to, to want to worship the Lord and, it's, and, and to have a personal relationship with him. It's amazing what is going on around the world. But I would like to show you another, another verse that is on uh, my heart and that's the one he who and I, this is revelation 22 20 he who testifies these things says surely i am coming quickly amen even so come lord jesus isn't that amazing that the lord is telling all, already the churches when he gave john the revelation two thousand years ago he says look he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. So on one hand, he, we see that there is a personal encounter of so many people with the Lord. But as a church, that's why the Bible says to teach those things in the churches. This is the letter to the churches. As a church, we are about to see him coming very soon to take us. To take us means that it's not going to be pretty down here. It means that it's going to be pretty up there. It means that we are not to expect things to be going great down here, but things will actually go the wrong direction. And I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of people, and there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of good people, conservatives, that are you know what they really want is uh, to triumph over the evil ones over the globalists, the secret cabals, those that are promoting so much evil in this world. And, you know, I think that we do need to expose evil, of course, all the time. But I want to remind you folks, we're out of this world, and we will be out of this world shortly. And this world is only going to get worse and worse, and this is exactly why the tribulation is coming, and, and the judgment of God is coming. So... I'm not sure the coronavirus is the judgment. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. I'm sure it's a warning sign. It's a huge warning sign for people to change. Look, God stopped everything. Everybody's home. Everybody has time. And God is asking, is asking them, are you done running that crazy race? And do you understand that your days are in my hands? Your time is in my hands. Your life is in my hands. Are you going to come back to me or not? And this is why I think that those verses from Revelation, uh, both chapter 3, when he spoke to the churches, of course, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. It's a personal relationship. He wants your heart. He wants your attention. Now you have all the time. You can't say, I have work to do. You can't say, I have places to go to. That's it. <laughs> you don't. And of course, regarding his coming, he is not going to be late. Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, all of us should say, come, Lord Jesus. So I just want to conclude this uh, update by telling you that these are the most amazing days in our lifetime. These days will be written in history pages. This is our chance to show the world what Christianity is all about. It's a relationship and not a religion. To believe in the Messiah of Israel is for the Jews as well as for the rest of the people of, 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 and the non-Jews. He is the promised Messiah. He is here and he wants a 
personal relationship with all of us. And now it's a time where he says, okay, guys, are you done? Here I am knocking on your door. If you open, I'll come in and dine. Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to barge in. If you open, he'll walk in and he will dine. There's nothing more amazing in the Middle East than breaking bread together. That means you are one. He's not going to just sit there. He's going to dine with us. He with us and us with him. It's not beautiful. It's a beautiful picture. So I want to encourage you to take this time and make the most out of it. Share this message. Share this update. Tell your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, whoever it is, this is the time for you to make up your mind. I'd like to conclude with the ironic blessing over all of you. And again, two days from now, tune in to our special update on how close are we to the mark of the beast. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you that peace that surpasses all understanding that only can come from the Prince of Peace, who is the Lord of Peace, who can give you that peace now, even now, and forever, and even here in your house and everywhere. And it's in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Shalom. Spread this message. Share it with as many as you can. And I'll see you two days from now on a super important update on how close are we to the mark of the beast. Shalom and uh, God bless you everyone.